I think we've been surrounded by death for so long, we've just gotten used to it. What kind of family finishes building a cemetery before starting the house? It's embarrassing for me to admit this, but... The pet cemetery may be more uncomfortable than the human one. Three of the gerbils were mine, and two had been my fault. Sven built the house, but it was Edie who designed the cemetery. I'm sure Odin's monument had been Edie's idea. My mom was always trying to move on, but for Edie, the past never went away. She could see it poking out of the water at low tide. Edie said she dreamed about the old house every night. Edie's side was always easier for me to understand. But the older I get, the more I can see where my mom was coming from. Her dad had been pretty strict, but it wasn't enough to save her brothers. She was just trying to do better. She lost two of her brothers, just like I did. I get why she tried so hard to protect us. We never found Milton's body, so my mom insisted we were putting up a monument, not a tombstone. things I wish I could ask my mom now. Part of me thinks this is what she wanted all along, for me to come back someday and find everything out for myself. But looking back on it now, If she told me there was going to be so much climbing, I never would have come when I was 22 weeks pregnant. I never met Grandpa Sam, but 
I think he and my mom had a lot in common. They were both pretty intense. Sam spent his life shooting photos, but mom said he got nervous being in front of the camera. I guess we're all afraid of something. Instead of hiding from death, Sam seemed to go out of his way to meet it. Dawn, I promise, you'll never forget this weekend. Yes, sir. These memories are gonna last a lifetime. Mm hmm Am I gonna have to shoot anything? It's a hunting trip, Dawn. Shooting is strongly encouraged. What? Perfect. It's gonna rain the whole weekend, isn't it? I will never forget this weekend, Dad. That's the spirit. Smile, Dawn. Okay, got it. I'm gonna take some pictures, okay? Just be careful. The camera's older than you are. You're right, Dad. It's starting to clear up. Still freezing, though. Definitely should not have drunk all that coffee. Hmm. Hey! <laughs> That's a keeper. Hold still while I take a picture of you. I'm just saying, I'm not always gonna be here, Don. You'll need to remember this stuff, if you want to survive. I'll be fine, Dad. You know who else thought he was gonna be fine? Some guy who died. Don, I'm being serious. I know, Dad. You're always serious. Doesn't being out here make you want to chill out? Well, to tell you the truth, I haven't been out here in 20 years. Last time I was with my brother Calvin. Man, that was a great... Dad! Good eyes, Don. Before you take the shot, let me get a picture of you. Dad, I... Just breathe. Turn off your imagination. Let me get behind you. Do I have to do this? Don. You don't have to do anything, but if you want to survive, you'll need to be strong. Great shot, Don! <laughs> I'm proud of you, Don. Always remember that, okay?
<laughs> Dad, it, it's twitching. I think That's it's totally so normal, Doc. Just focus on the camera. Try not to think about. Dad. Oh! Of all these stories, that's the one I wish most that my mom had told me. After Sam died, my mom and Edie got really close. They'd both lost a lot. Dear Kay, do you remember the way Gregory used to laugh when he thought he was alone? Like something funny was happening, but only he could see it. Time to hold on, sweetie. Hello, Sam. I told you I don't want to talk right now. I wonder what he saw. Maybe if I hadn't called that night.
Good luck, Kay. Love, Sam. Imagine my mom ever writing poetry, and yet. A poem for Gus, who always said the wedding was a bad idea. Our father never hit us kids, at least not very hard, before the day my brother said with teenage disregard that he'd be dead before he'd see a wedding in our yard. My father made him come, of course, but Gus stood far apart, just flew his kite and bottled up the storm inside his heart. I tried to talk him out of it, but though he'd never met her, we don't need a stepmom were the words that I I now pronounce you husband and wife. You may kiss the bride. photos came, Dad ordered him to come, come here. here. But Gus declined, and as a sign, held up his middle finger. The wind picked up, and panicked geese appeared and quickly went. But all the humans did that day was go inside the tent. buckets then, but no one seemed afraid that nature might destroy the tent our dad had crudely made. The thunder sounded much too close and full of angry power, but all my father said to this was, make the music louder. that I could truly say I thought about you on that day. Out there on the beach alone, just you, the wind, the sea, and foam. But I didn't, until we found you. She never talked about him, but mom told me once if I was a boy, they were going to name me Gus. My mom moved up to the loft after her brothers died. At the time, it was as far away as she could get. She spent a summer building houses in Calcutta, where she met my dad, Sanjay.
Religion was another thing my mom never talked about, but I think it helped her a lot after her dad died. My mom moved to India a week after graduation and got a job teaching English. Louis was born a year later. When my dad died, I don't think mom knew where else to go. I'm sure Edie was happy to have her back. The house had to get a little bigger, but Edie was used to that. And for a while, things were good, almost normal. But it didn't last. The beginning of the end was Milton's 10th birthday, when Edie gave him a castle. Milton Finch in The Magic Paintbrush. was four when Milton disappeared. Mom spent months searching for my brother. Then she sealed the doors. Whatever Milton had found in the house, Mom didn't want it getting out. Mom definitely blamed Edie, but I think Lewis blamed himself. After he graduated, he just spent more and more time in his room until mom got him a job at the cannery.
Lewis's room smelled very, very familiar. That part of him lived on. Lewis and I spent a lot of time playing games together, but he was surprisingly bad at them. He died a lot. Dear Mrs. Finch, as Lewis's psychiatrist, I can understand your desire for an explanation. As I see it, the trouble began in January, shortly after we convinced your son to seek treatment for substance abuse. Newly sober, I believe Lewis first noticed the monotony of his daily life. He kept working at the cannery, but he withdrew part of himself. In our sessions, I saw the same behavior. His mind began to wander. I asked him to describe it. He said he started small, imagining a labyrinth. He could feel his way about. Then something moved. Bats. And toads. And things that have not names. He knew it was all in his head. He took it very seriously. I had hoped he'd find himself. But he found something more. I worried about him then. Daydreaming at the cannery. I spoke with his boss, but he said Lewis had become a model employee, methodical, tireless, focused. Like a whole new Lewis. So I let him go on. I even encouraged him. It seemed very promising at first. He told me he'd made a new friend. On the edge of a city he named Lewis Topia. He built the city up slowly, brick by brick. Then he made musicians. songs for them to play. He talked about starting a band. And he was always humming something. Every day his imagination grew stronger. He no longer spoke at the cannery. But his chopping was as reliable as ever. Then one day it struck him that all the cheering crowds, even the stones under his feet, were all in his imagination. So he could do whatever he wished. He 
held an election for mayor. And he won. They begged him to stay, but his mind was already wandering. It became a game for him. He'd conquer a city, then immediately push on. New Lewisville. St. Louis. He started drifting away from our reality. Minneapolis. Until one day he forgot to go home from the cannery. Even as his mother pleaded with him, part of Lewis kept sailing on. In Lewisburg, he heard rumors of a handsome queen. The queen was on her own quest for sinister serpents. He followed the sound of her silver harp. His chase led him to a golden palace east of the sun and west of the moon. Even then, his logic remained sound. He knew the world was all in his imagination. But he was so proud of having created it. In his own eyes, he'd become something greater than a king. For someone who'd never known success in the real world, I think it was overwhelming. And then it struck him that the real Lewis was not the one chopping salmon, but the one climbing the steps of a golden palace. My imagination is as real as my body, he told me. It was hard to argue with him. He began to forget the world we know. I think it pained him to remember Lewis, the cannery worker. He began to despise the man with a royal contempt. I still thought I could save him. Even after he said he was being crowned king over all the lands of wonder. The poem
palace would be packed with his companions. including the wise Calico who had insisted on inviting him. His queen waited, holding his crown. There's only one thing left to do. Bend down his head. And the rest I think you know. Mrs. Finch, your son, was a kind man who will be missed by all of us who knew him. My brother was really cool. I wish you could have met him. back from Lewis's funeral, my mom told me to start packing. She waited until the day before we left to tell Edie. I'm not sure if she wanted to make it easier or harder. I wish we'd stayed. But I understand why we left. My mom ended up leaving everything behind. What happened that night had been coming for a long time. Maybe it should have come sooner. But it had to end one way or another. All that's left now is to tell you about that last night. That whole last day, Edie just watched us pack and didn't say a word. Until supper, when she raised her glass and said, To our final night together, and all our final nights apart. Grandma, you know what I said about alcohol. Some of your medications are very Edith, specific. I left a present for you in the hallway. Why don't you go open it? The grown-ups have to argue now. I'm sorry, you're right. We're all leaving tomorrow. Let's just enjoy our last... I'm not leaving. Edith, you're excused. The power had been shut off that morning, but Edie always had plenty of candles. When my mom sailed the library, I don't think she knew about the other entrance. Or that Edie had a key to it. Not 
thing you're afraid of isn't going to end when you leave the house. Edith has a right to know these stories. My children are dead because of your stories. I think it's best if Edith and I leave tonight. We'll have the nursing home send a van for you in the morning. Okay. Dear Edith, there's so many stories I wish I could tell you, but there's only time for one. This is about what happened on the night you were born. That night, the tide went way, way out. It was the first and last time I ever saw the old house aground. There'd been an earthquake out in the middle of the ocean. They called it the lowest tide in a thousand years. God, it smelled awful. You know, I've seen that house every day of my life. I never thought I'd go back to it. When the fog rolled in, I lost my way. I got turned around. For a while, I wandered. I started seeing things. Things I'd forgotten had ever existed. But when I saw them, they felt old friends. That night, a lot of things came back to me. Or maybe I came back to them. Things I can't explain, but that I need you to try and... It is what are you doing in here? It's mine. Edith! Mom, you're gonna rip it! Let go! I kicked and screamed, but... Mom dragged me to the car. I never saw Great Grandma Edie again. The next morning, the band came to pick her up, but she was already gone. After that, we moved around a lot. We both tried to make the best of it. A few years went by. My mom didn't like to talk about it. But she started getting sick a lot. <coughs> the rest happened pretty quickly. She got better for a while. And then she didn't. And then I was alone. last finch left alive. Until I found out about you. I'm still not sure what to tell you about all this. If we lived forever, maybe we'd have time to understand things. But as it is, I think the best we can do is try to open our eyes. 
and appreciate how strange and brief all of this is. This journal was supposed to be for you. But now I hope you'll never see it. I just want to meet you. And tell you all these stories myself. But I guess if you're reading this now, things didn't work out that way. This is where your story begins. I'm sorry I won't be there to see it. It's a lot to ask, but I don't want you to be sad that I'm gone. I want you to be amazed that any of us ever had a chance to be here at all. Good luck.